Senior Policy, Policy Advisor, Advisor, America First Policies. Good morning, Minneapolis. Yay, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Now please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What a great pleasure to be here. First time I've been in Minneapolis, a beautiful city, beautiful city, wonderful people. Everybody's above average. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this lovely hotel, the High Regency, and to our Tax Cuts to Put America First tour, the Minneapolis stop. I want to thank our men in uniform in the front row here. Thank you for your service. Defending our lovely country and our hard-won freedoms, so important. America First Policies is a nonprofit grassroots organization. We are dedicated to supporting key policy initiatives that work for all citizens, one America, that will put America first and make America great forever. As long as we stand vigilant together, America will be great. We are committed to empowering, educating, and mobilizing people like you, millions of Americans who want to make America safer, stronger, more prosperous, and greater than ever. And mobilization is a key part of it, but you can't be mobilized until you know what to be mobilized for, until you're educated. So that's why we exist, to make sure that we get the information out that you need, that we need to understand, because we have to have an understanding to be a self-governing nation. We can't rely on other people to do our thinking for us. We have to think for ourselves. Right. America First policies, like you, we believe in putting America first. And that means standing up to countries like China that will take our jobs, take our industries, steal our intellectual property, steal our industry, steal, suck the very lifeblood out of our country and call it free trade, when it's not free. It's one way, and we can't let that happen anymore. For once, for the first time, after 20 years of being robbed, of being taken advantage of, of being treated like babies, we're finally doing something about it. America First Policies was on the front line defending the action to defend America against economic aggression the same way these wonderful men and women have been defending our country against military aggression. <laughs> Putting America first means making sure that we the people get to govern our nation, not them to bureaucrats. <laughs> it means making sure there are fewer federal regulations on the books, not more. Getting rid of things like the waters of the USA rule, where some bureaucrats sitting in a cubicle in some faraway capital, beavering away, deciding to regulate how to use a puddle on the back 40. No. I, I think the people who live on the front 40 have a better idea how that works. <laughs> they know when the tadpole is growing feet and when it's not, when it just has a little wiggly tail on the back. It means reining in these overzealous government bureaucrats. And I'll tell you what, I have worked inside the bureaucracy. I have seen good people, they're just hardworking people. They get up and do their job every day. Unfortunately, their job is dreaming up new regulations that you and I and the rest of us have to live by. And 
they don't have necessarily a connection to real life and the real world and how it works. And the same way, when you go to work at your business, you want to make sure that you produ produce results for your business and, and produce something, they get up in the morning and they want to make sure that they produce more regulations. And that's not really the way America is supposed to work. That's not the way a free enterprise system is supposed to work, and that's not the way a uh, a, a free people are supposed to work. They're not, we're not supposed to be ruled by folks somewhere far away telling us how to do every little thing. So we are on the front lines with America First policies, making sure we get rid of needless, useless, counterproductive regulations. There's still a need for clean air, clean water. I don't want anybody dumping their poisons into my children's bloodstream, you know, through their nose, into their lungs, into their blood, no but it goes far beyond that. We don't need things like the Paris Climate Accords, which puts us at a disadvantage to countries like China and where we're gonna be transferring billions of dollars and giving them our technology while we're being held back. So that's over. That is over. <laughs> Putting America first means fighting for judges that will uphold the Constitution not rewrite the laws as they see fit. So when we have a president who says, I want to enforce the immigration laws on the books, we don't have a judge somewhere who says, no, I decided we're gonna do it differently than that. That's not right. Putting America first, means having an immigration system that works for the citizens and the lawful residents of America first. It means having an immigration system that brings in people who want to be here, respect our values, believe in America, speak our language, and have the skills to make America greater than ever. They believe there should be no borders. They should believe there should be no citizenship. I've actually read that. I've heard these people on TV and I've read them saying, well, you know, it's not enough just to let anybody illegal immigrants, there's no such thing as illegal. We have to get rid of the concept of citizenship because that excludes people. So we, America first means we have a country. We have a tradition, we have values that are worth defending that are worth standing up for, that are worth passing on to our children, and yes, passing on to the rest of the world. We don't have to be apologetic about it. Look, I flew here the other day, and uh, when I got on that airplane, the person came up front and they said, you know what, uh, in case of emergency, a mask will, oxygen mask will drop down. Put the mask on first before you help somebody else. And that's what America First is about. We have to take care of ourselves so we can be strong and able to help everybody else. We are a generous people. We want to help the world. We have done more to help the world than any other nation in history. And we can be proud of that. We're good people. I believe that, and we believe that. America First is here to fight for the policies that will preserve our country and make America great again. We are here and we were in the fight to make sure Congress passed the biggest tax overhaul in a generation. We made sure that we got rid of the fine, the fine, you were given a fine if you didn't buy insurance you didn't want, couldn't afford, and didn't give you the coverage you needed. We got rid of that. Well, this Tax Cut and Jobs Act has already had tremendous, tremendous impact. We see real wages rising. We see unemployment going down. We see that black and Hispanic unemployment is at a historic low, lowest it's ever been. And you see, that's the way 
the America First policies work. They work for everybody. We don't divide Americans into different categories. A rising tide lifts all boats. And as America is stronger and greater, everybody in it will be more prosperous, happier. We want to make America the best place on earth to live, work, invest, raise a family, do business, and it's starting to happen. Manufacturing's coming back. Re manufacturing's coming back. Retirement accounts stronger than ever. We finally got rid of that Obamacare mandate. But we're not done yet. Are we done yet? We're not done yet. No, good. We're not done yet. Are we tired of winning yet? <laughs> hey! Please join us. America First Policies is here, as I said, to educate, keep everybody, keep everybody informed of what you need to do. We need to say, you know, we can't just come out on election day. We've got to stay on top of these swamp creatures. Because I'll tell you, the swamp creatures are out there every day nibbling away at the congressmen, telling them what to do. We've got to be there too. And, you know, I'm not saying take a bite out of the congressman. I'm just saying we've got to be in their ear, you know? And so please follow us on Facebook. Follow us, sign up for us at AmericaFirstPolicies.org, uh, and we will get every, keep you apprised of the important legislation coming down the pike, all the fights that we've got to be involved in to keep this government representing we the people, not them the swamp creatures. Because if we keep fighting, if we keep fighting every day, each and every day, we will make America great again. And I promise you. I know it. They said it couldn't be done. We're doing it. <laughs> so now, it's time to hear from our panel. We're going to talk about the tax cuts. And we're going to hear from people who actually were involved in writing it and people doing business who can explain and talk about what it means to them. And after the panel, I know you're going to say, stop, please, I can't take it anymore, we've had enough. But then we'll be joined by some very special guests, members of the Cabinet of the United States of America and the Vice President. So, so it is now my pleasure to introduce the panel. Representing the people of the 3rd Congressional District of Minnesota, a member of the Ways and Means Committee, and those are the folks who wrote the tax bill, and the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, Congressman Eric Paulson. <laughs> Representing the people of the 6th Congressional District. Do we have the 6th Congressional District in the House? A member of the House Financial Services Committee, Congressman Tom Emmers. A third generation business owner, another former radio talk show host representing the people of the second congressional district, Congressman Jason Lewis. Step right up. And, and when it comes to hiring and manufacturing in America, he always puts America first. He employs at least 1,100 people right here in Minnesota, making products sold everywhere. You've seen him on TV. You've heard him on the radio. You've even slept on his pillow. My pillow founder and CEO, Mike Linda. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. Let's get started. Yay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. It's great to have you all here. Uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, signed by President Trump in December 2017, was the most significant reform we have seen in a generation. Uh, we're lucky to have here with us uh, Mr. Paulson, who helped write this. So let's jump in. Why did we need? a tax cut overhaul. What was so important? I'll put that to everybody, but I'll defer to our friend on the ways. Well, Curtis, maybe I'll kick it off. Uh, I think as folks know here, uh, for too long we've had an uncompetitive tax code. We've seen our jobs shipped overseas. We've not been able to compete around the world even though we want to sell American goods and services. And so making sure we don't have the highest corporate rate, making sure we're putting money back in your pockets. Uh, we, you can spend this money better than the federal government. That's the key defining principles here. I think 1.9% economic growth pretty much says it all, no, Curtis. Uh, we had a decade of 
overspending, a stimulus plan, and yet we were still growing at 1.9% economic growth. Every time we've encouraged more work savings and investment, in the 20s, in the 60s, during the Reagan era, we got more work savings and investment, and now we're seeing that again. That's why we did it. Well, it's great. We've already started to see some results. Uh, over 400 companies, I believe, that I, I can't keep track every minute the, the number goes up, have given bonuses, pay raises, uh, increased donations to the 401k or philanthropic donations. What are we seeing here in Minneapolis in Minnesota. Uh, you must hear from your constituents. U.S. So. Bank. U.S. Bank's a great example. 60,000 employees got a thousand dollar raise. They're investing more in the communities that they serve. They're invest investing more in the business itself. You hear that all the way from the big ones to the small ones. I've got a small company, Super Swivel, in my district. Super Swivel. Super Swivel. They do swivels, specialized swivels for car washes. And he told me that he's going to share a little of these savings with all of his employees by giving them all a $1,000 raise. You hear these stories all across Minnesota and, quite frankly, all across the country. I think I knew a congressman named Super Swivel, but I, I <laughs> different. I, I think there are different. Fuel, you know, the, the yeah. sad part Which is way's I think he blowing did there? <laughs> a congressman named Super Swivel. Well, and it's, it's like at uh, my pillow. We've been doing that before, and now other companies are able to do that. We've uh, to share to we create careers in my pillow rather than just jobs, and to have uh -huh. other companies that pass that savings on to their on to their employees. That's where it's at. And you know, I hear a lot of companies about where we're at. Um, um, just following suit, you know, yeah. like giving them bonuses, raises, and everything else. Oh, great. That's awesome. There's a great company in my district, Data Sales, $1,000 bonus. Nancy Pelosi said that's crumbs. The average tax cut in the second district, $3,000. Is that three crumbs? Right. Three crumbs. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> actually, pretty soon it adds up to real money. Right. Right. Pretty. Uh, and, I see, and I see the employees. I see it's not crumbs for them. It's not crumbs. And by the way, it's not those big companies, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, you know, the U.S. banks, the best buys of the world. It's also small companies and entrepreneurs, which is what has really made America a great country, right? I, I talked to one couple in my district, small company. They put their heart and soul working 100 hours a week. They're hiring their very first employee now because of the tax. Oh, right. That's so. great. Well, um, and it's, and it's, you know, it's not just the C-Corps. They set it up for the pass-through entities, the LLCs and the S-Corps, which uh, that 20% savings on the, in the that is just amazing. And that was a big thing to be added on. So it wasn't just for the big companies, for the little ones. Well, that's a huge thing, yeah. uh, Mike, because uh, you always hear about the big companies, General Electric, for example, and I'm not just picking on them. They paid no taxes because they got like a million, they have an army of accountants and lawyers. Right, right. So by giving a tax cut to the small businesses and to everybody, they, those are the folks who were having to pay the high taxes, okay. the little guys. Think about that. The top rate, small pass through business was 39.6. Take out the phase outs of deductions, it's 43.44. Add Martin Dayton's 10%, it's 54. Self employment tax, 15.3%. Pretty soon the marginal rate on a small pass through business is 60%. Right. Uh, of course, we're going to get more economic growth when we cut that back down to an average rate of 29. Well, let's talk about the deductions. The standard deduction uh, for couples, what was it and how has it changed under this law and what does that mean exactly? Well, it was about $12,000 for a couple. It's been doubled to about $24,000. What it, what it means, uh, and obviously the, uh, the committee that drafted it can give you more details, but 90%, I think, is the estimate of people will now simply take the standard deduction and will get a better deduction than they would if they had to itemize. So it's actually good for people, for individuals who, by the way, going back to the theme at the beginning, these people out here know how to use their money much better than the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So I, I think the easy way to think of it also is if you're, you're a couple and you have nearly $24,000 in a new standard deduction, the first $24,000 is tax-free, right. right off the bat. I like that. Right off the bat. That's good. Uh, you know, you made a good... By the way, remember, uh, because we had, and I know we're not being political, this is not partisan, right? <laughs> That's right. But we had somebody announce yesterday when Mike Pence came to Minnesota that uh, it's all about giving tax breaks to the wealthy. That is one of the most dishonest statements that has ever been made. This tax cut bill actually delivers more savings to people all the way down to the lowest uh, end of the financial rung than anything that's been done before. And what Eric's talking about is you're talking about that young couple that lives in my district, maybe St. Michael or Albertville, that combined they're making about $75,000. Imagine what this means to that young couple that wants to start a family, wants to reach a, a different level of their quality of life. 
You have just given them $24,000 tax-free before they even get started. I think it's a great program for everyone in the tax, uh, in the finance. I heard a story at our last stop. <laughs> at our last stop on the tour, we were uh, in Atlanta, and I heard a story uh, that was shared of a 14-year-old who wrote a letter uh, thanking the congressman for the tax cut. Because now with that increased deduction, his parents are gonna be able to send him to flight school. In, in Georgia, you only have to be 14 years old to start taking a lesson to be a pilot, right? And that was his dream. He is now gonna be able to realize his dream and he's starting to look into how to apply to the Air Force Academy. That's so, awesome. I don't think that tax cut is a millionaire and a billionaire. That's, That's awesome. That's right. We have a colleague, by the way, sorry to uh, take over, but we have a colleague, by the way, a true story, if you want to know how many people this affects and how far down the financial spectrum it goes, we have a colleague from Arizona who goes into his local Starbucks every morning, grabs a coffee. He told us the story of walking up to the counter. He's got a gal behind the counter, a barista, who's got uh, all kinds of uh, art, uh, body art and, uh, and tattoo or, uh, uh, piercings. And she served him, and he'd never talked to her. And she gave him the coffee, and she said, thanks for the tax cut, dude. <laughs> She, she used the savings to get another piercing, I guess. I, I don't know. But it's working for everybody. <laughs> it's working for everybody. Uh, amen and hallelujah to that. Uh, so uh, you, you also put, touched on a good point uh, when you said that we know, we know how to spend our money better than the bureaucrats or better than Washington. It's kind of like this is a stimulus program, isn't it? But it's a stimulus program not funded with tax money not funded through Washington where we get to decide what the stimulus is going to be. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects of the tax cut bill is the uh, being able to write off. Businesses can write off uh, new equipment the year they make it instead of going through some complicated uh, so to, you, you, you were able just, to get, just tell me what you've done. Pillow. We bought a machine that we were going to buy otherwise we just got it in February and uh, we uh, created 15 new jobs that just for that machine that we were able to get and write it off this year. So that directly affected us immediately. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do something we could no longer, that we, another company we had to have do, now we can do it in-house. Oh, so, that's great. Uh, yeah. Right here in Minnesota. Right here in Minnesota. <laughs> you know, Curtis, I think it's really important to make the distinction between a tax cut stimulus and an $836 billion federal spending stimulus. Mm -hmm. This is a stimulus that doesn't just give you more money to spend, but encourages work and savings and investment. Right. And so when capital and labor can come together and increase productivity, that is the only way you're gonna get your rising tide where the worker gains and the business gains. Mm -hmm. and I always like to tell people, the truck driver's a heck of a lot more productive with the truck. <laughs> and, <laughs> Funny how that works. And so who, who provides the, the capital to buy the truck? The business owner. So bringing labor and capital together and stopping this politics of envy and divvying up America is really what this is all about and it's working. And, 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 and look, look, the last time that we had tax reform was way back in 1986. And look, in our committee and as we were preparing for this for the last year, we knew if you're going to reform the tax code and you do it once in a generation, do it for growth. So this immediate expensing provision essentially means now you can buy your software for your company, you can buy new machines for your company that will make you more productive, hire more people. Um, expense it in one year. You don't have to have depreciation schedules that go out 10, 15 years of complications that accountants have to follow. This eliminates, it's a lot simpler and it's a lot clearer and it's a lot pro-growth oriented. Oh, that's great, that's great. You know, that's, uh, let's look behind the scenes for a, a brief moment. Uh, it's been said, that, well, look, not just that it's been said, this thing seemed to get done real quick this tax cut bill. Uh, very complicated, biggest tax cut in a generation, and it came together, even though everybody said it can't be done, never gonna happen, it did. But it, it wasn't thrown together. A lot of research went into this, as I understand, but you'd be the man to... Uh, you know, I think we had uh, you know, 40 plus hearings over a six year period laying the groundwork. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do it if it were not for the president. Um, the Senate was always kind of an iffy proposition. Uh, but look, it all got done and the, the results are really encouraging after only a couple of months. Um, I mean, that's, I think for the long term, we're looking at some real growth that's gonna help everyone in this room, help everyone in Minnesota, help everyone in the country. So the tax cut bill is, in a, is similar to the economy itself. There's a lot of pent up demand of business investment was holding back for years, it was building for six years, and finally uh, uh, it got done. 
the way the tax cut got done, we're now seeing investment that's been held back because people were afraid of regulation, afraid of high taxes, and now we're seeing like the dam broke and it's coming loose. Mm -hmm. And the same naysayers that were around during the Jimmy Carter era, you know, the era of malaise, we've reached the limits of growth, this can't be done, it won't do anything, except we went from 1.9% growth to over 3% already, and the Atlanta Fed says we may hit 5%. So they've been proven wrong once again, which seems to become a pattern here. Isn't it funny? <laughs> a lot of these experts that are telling us what to think and what's right, what's wrong, they just can't seem to get it right. <laughs> now, the administration uh, and, and the president, uh, and, and we're going to be joined later by, I'll give you a little secret, uh, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, a great man. I had the pleasure of working with him uh, before the administration took over, um, has talked about using a combination of tax cuts, tax reform, regulatory reform, trade reform, and energy reform. You put them all together, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. They, they work together. It's like, look, you can eat flour and you can eat sugar, but you put them together with some egg yolks and milk and you got a cake. And that's better than eating flour and sugar separately. You know, it's going to taste better. And that's the same way this whole program works. So how do the tax cuts work with these other parts to really get the economy, to really goose the economy and get, get it moving again? Well, I, I think Tom can talk about some of the regulatory reforms we've seen and will see in the financial industry in particular with community banks, for instance. But I'll just tell you, who would have believed with all the regulatory reforms we saw in the first year, the expectation of tax reform building into the economy and growth um, that we as the United States now would be a net energy exporter and have the opportunity now in a few short years to be the world's number one oil producer in the world. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. There's a regulatory reform. Regulatory reform. Well, I, I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's all related, but history, if you, were, if you don't learn from it, you're bound to repeat it. In this case, in some cases, we're trying to repeat it. You know from the 1980s, that it was three things that were done under the Reagan administration. There were tax cuts, there were regulatory reform, elimination of excessive, duplicative, overly burdensome regulation, unnecessary regulation. And then the third piece, which is I think what Eric was alluding to when he said about the community banks, uh, in that uh, era, what they did was it was about wealth creation, a strong dollar. It was about creating wealth as opposed to creating debt which for some reason, the US and other nations around the world have been creating a lot of debt for several years. The first piece is giving the money back to these people. The first piece is letting people know that they make better decisions than government or any bureaucrat employed in government can make. The second piece is freeing them up to use that. That's the regulatory reform. And the last piece is capital formation, which we so desperately need because Mike talks about being able to buy that $800,000 machine. The short-term benefits of this, this tax plan are combined with the long-term, but you don't get the full effect unless people like us can walk into our local community bank or credit union. We don't have, God bless them, we need them. The J.P. Morgan Chases, the, uh, all the Goldman Sachs, they're important, but we need our family-owned, member-owned local financial institutions that can do character lending again and say, Curtis is a risk I'm willing to take so you can start the next great business that grows out of a garage like Medtronic or Harley Davidson or Walt Disney. That's the next piece that has to get done. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me just add to that I mean, and talk about Mike, Mike a little bit. The Hayek used to call it the fatal conceit. When you hand over your, your treasure, when you hand over the regulatory apparatus to government, how are they going to know to invest in my pillow? Mm -hmm. Why didn't they come up with that? But Mike Lindell did. Why? Because when people are free, they can create the things they want to create. They know what's happening in the economy. They know the supply and demand equation. They know much more than the fatal conceit of government. And this guy's a living example of that. Thank you. Being able to make everything here in the USA, you know, there's a, a friend of mine told me once, you know, when companies left here, like as a snowmobile company, they left the, the seat, the guys that made the seats follow, the guys that made the nuts and bolts, the guys that made, like eight company follows. Now doing that in reverse, like at Pillow. now we have 1,600 direct employees, mm -hmm. but we probably affect 20,000 employees around the country, where the, where the patent and phone is made in Wisconsin, where the fabric's made in the Carolinas. 
and it's uh, so bringing all those companies back. One gets back here, and then eight of them follow. Right. Yeah. No, th that, that's very important. People don't understand when you get rid of one little company, everything that goes into the, making that. Yeah. That absolutely. Every little part here with my pillow, just even the plastic that goes on the, that we package in, that's made in the USA. You know, I mean, it just, everything goes out from there. We just, every part, and if everybody did that, it'd be amazing. That's the ripple effect. Yep. And we d now do it in the other way. You know, you have the ripple effect of destroying like the ecosystem, the manufacturing ecosystem, but now we're revitalizing yep. it. Bring it back, bring it back. And you were back to, I mean, my pillow, you probably got a loan from uh, Goldman Sachs or something like that, right? <laughs> no, they didn't even look at me. <laughs> now they want me to say no. <laughs> Uh, you were talking about the community banks, and, yeah. and that, that's so important. To, the, the, the big boys don't have the personal relationships that the community banks do. Now, on the House Financial Services Committee, you've been dealing with some of the uh, regulatory effects of, uh, that have really been hitting the smaller banks more right. than the big banks. Right. I mean, if you look back at the, at the time of the crash in 2008, we had roughly 8,000 community banks across the country, and we had roughly the same number of credit unions. Since the uh, financial uh, meltdown in 2008, uh, actually, go back. So 2008, you got about 8,000 of each. A year later, a year later after the meltdown, you still had roughly the same amount. It's now been seven plus years since the great Dodd-Frank law was passed with all of these uh, heightened scrutiny and the, uh, the extra uh, uh, compliance requirements and everything else that, by the way, were intended for the largest banks not only in the country but the world, but they, go, they apply all the way down the financial services food chain. Since Dodd-Frank was enacted, we're now down to uh, somewhere around 6,000 uh, community banks and credit unions. And what you'll hear from people is, well, this started years ago. This started after the savings and loan crisis. This has been going since uh, the late 90s. That might be true, but one of the reasons I believe it's happened is because every time you have a financial crisis, you have the do-gooders with election certificates who jump in and once again try to tell people how to do their business better. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that no uh, uh, supervision is required. Yes, there is some, but when you do too much, you start to starve out the lower end of the financial services food chain, and this is the place where the capital formation for the new startup companies is so important in this country. And if we're ever gonna get back to that level again where we're producing my pillow times 10, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to have a revitalization, a renaissance of credit unions and community banks in this country. Yeah. And, yeah. and the irony is, the irony in Dodd-Frank is there's an explicit bailout in there called the Orderly Liquidation yeah. Authority. That's not going to be there for the small community banks. Right. It's there for the big guys. The day James Comey testified, we actually passed the Financial Choice Act, which effectively repealed Dodd-Frank. Mm -hmm. Naturally, the Senate is, is yet to act. This is nonpartisan. <laughs> right. uh, but, but I mean, look, the, the bottom line is the government in many ways created the financial meltdown with easy money and restrictions on loans and going through all of that, which created the bubble and created the debt, and then they're the ones that say they're going to come in and fix it. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not going to, you're going to fix it. The American people are going to fix it, and the American economy is going to fix it, not the government. Yeah, it's, it's funny way. Government has a way of, the, the do-gooders in the government, bless their hearts, uh, they have a way of creating a problem and then magically proposing the solution, and it's them. Yeah. <laughs> more of them. It's always more of them. More of them. Uh, we are, uh, one, one of the things that kind of overlooked a lot in the discussion of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, and which will help family businesses and help farmers, is the repeal of the death tax, the inheritance tax. Yes! <laughs> Do we have a family farmer in the audience? Tell us about it. No, no. Can you, can you explain how that works and why that's so important? I mean, I'll explain why this is so important. It's not only wanting to protect maybe a generation of a family farmer that wants to hand it on down to the next generation to continue farming or a small business. I've got a, a business in Bloomington, and it impacts more than just the family. It's a, a, a heating and uh, ventilation company. So if, if they have to pay more taxes than they're able to on the death of the owner, all of a sudden 200 other people are out of work. 
And so this ripples through the economy. It's actually a net job loser um, mm -hmm. if we don't have that reform. So it's a critical key component to protect those jobs and family passed on businesses. And this actually came up in my pillow. They, uh, uh, we worked on this for two months before this was passed. It's like, what are we going to do? It went upside down my pillow for my kids and my family, and uh, and and uh, they wouldn't be able to pay the taxes on the, uh -huh. on the uh, if I if I died. And, uh, and, so and think about it. Mo way. Most C corporations, when their CEO dies, yeah, there's no taxable event. The board hires another CEO. They right. hire new officers or vote on new officers. But when a pass-through small business sole proprietor or LLC dies, all of a sudden you've got to start selling off your hard assets to get liquid in order to pay the tax man. Mm -hmm. And the, the deceased does not pay the tax. There's no <laughs> how that works. There's no, there's no taxation without respiration. <laughs> And when there is respiration, the taxation never ends. It but now there's the value of the tax in the businesses, yeah. It looked like you were going to jump in there. No, he pretty much hit it. I, I hadn't hit the respiration, I hadn't heard the respiration line yet, but I love it. Well said, dude. Yeah. <laughs> my, my folks told me anybody could grow up to be a member of Congress, and now I believe it. <laughs> That's one thing I got tired of talking about my company. I go, I'm not dying today. Come on, come on. Well, you, that's a really good point you made there, Mr. Lewis. Uh, the C Corporation, they, the CEO dies. Why? They just keep going and going and going. These corporations never die. It's sort of like a government program. They never die. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, the small company, the small business, boom, they get hit with a tax. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've talked to a lot of small business people. And this is why small businesses sell out to those C Corporations, right. who then end up moving production to their central facility in China or someplace like that, and it ends up costing jobs and it destroys the local communities. Uh, whether it's the bankers or the little league that depended on donations from that local company and the personal relationship. So, uh, it, this is huge. It's huge. Just that one little bit of getting rid of the inheritance tax, uh, that too has a ripple effect. Uh, from the local to the, to the global. Uh, the other aspect of this tax cut bill is going to affect the repatriation of money, which is a $20 word. Can you all break that down, put it in plain English? What are we talking about here? Look, I mean, I think this is some of the most profound benefits of this tax overhaul that we're going to continue to see the results in the long term. Um, and it's not just the Apple of the world, right, that's coming back with a 350 billion dollar investment returning money Can back I get to the United States, right? I mean, that's a lot of money that they're yeah. building, new plants, new employees that are coming in. But you have three trillion dollars trapped overseas just because our companies in America are selling American goods and services, but they don't want to bring it back because of our high rates. We fix that. So no longer do we penalize ourselves. We can keep the innovation here in the United States, we keep the jobs here, and we keep the headquarters here. This is a good thing. Um, those are the most profound, I think, provisions that are going to have lasting, long-term uh, effects and benefits for us. And Curtis, you do get a piece of that. Oh. Because if these companies reinvest in this country, if they continue to grow, not only does the economy grow, which uh, it's to, to uh, Jason Lewis's earlier point, it lifts all boats, but then you got lower prices, you got more choice, you got all kinds of good things that come to the consumer, to the citizens of this country. And you also have more people paying into the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare Trust Fund. So even the retirees are getting a piece of that $350 billion. And we're the only country to have this worldwide tax. Every oh, other really? country, you're in foreign profits, you bring them back, you pay the foreign tax, you bring it back. You pay the 12.5% in Ireland, you bring the money back to America, they say, oh, that's great, but you owe us 20, or, you know, 20 more percent, whatever the case might be, because we're going to charge our tax too. Uh, they, they, you know, this is why we get these tax inversions where these corporate headquarters go abroad, they go to Dublin. Uh, I used to think the double Irish was a drink, um, uh, but apparently it's a tax strategy. But with repatriation and getting back to a territorial tax, um, we're going to bring back the, the trillions in foreign profits that are sitting overseas. That's why, why would anyone be opposed to that? Right. So, so I didn't quite understand that, but you, you explained it very well. It used to be a, a, a global he was a radio company. talk show host. <clears throat> he makes complicated things. That's how he used to get paid. So were you. Yeah, I was going to say. And watch, watch it, Emerson. So was the vice president. <laughs> yeah, but Jason, you were good. Oh! 
Okay, no, I didn't hear the vice president. I was talking about me. Oh. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> He's listening. <laughs> so, so it used to be you, you got a big company, you make money overseas, you pay tax overseas, and then when you, if you want to bring the money back to the United States, you'd pay tax again here? Right. right. And it used to be at 35. 35%. Right. Which no is why everybody, the said, over there. Which is why everybody right. said if you brought it to 25 or lower, you would see a reversal of the money. Yeah. And as it turns out, it ended up at 21, and that's exactly what we're seeing. In, in fact, I think, Eric, on the Ways and Means scorecard, I think you estimated, what, $338 billion in repatriation new revenue coming back. Helping our. For, yeah. Coming back in new tax revenue right. from the trillions brought, brought back. Right. And that helps seniors and baby boomers who want to rely on Social Security and Medicare. It helps young people who want a growing competitive economy so they can compete for jobs and move up the economic uh, ladder. Um, it's a really good thing. Those are the most profound impacts for the lasting long term. We've already seen uh, Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler, has now said it's going to build its pickup trucks in Michigan instead of Mexico. They used to build them in Mexico. <laughs> and to your point, if they're building pickup trucks in Michigan, maybe they'll make the brake shoes in Minnesota instead Absolutely. of Mishwakam. Absolutely. They'll probably bring 30 companies with them. Yeah, yeah. 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 The automotive uh, parts industry, Absolutely. huge industry, yeah. huge industry. Uh, and this is what we saw in the 80s when the, the Japanese started building cars here in America. It, it built up a whole further uh, industry of automotive parts. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, I love the way you broke that down, Mike. It, it's the, the ecosystem, the, the manufacturing supply chain, the food chain. Uh, it, it's so important. And I, I love your commitment to making things in America. Yeah, it's, so it's, there's nothing more rewarding. <laughs> Just to, just to see all these, you know, not just jobs, but careers, you know, and to see, you know, helping so many people that way. But, yeah, you know, I, to put your mind to all these other companies that are part of my pillow, you know, and that, uh, and all those jobs created. And then knowing that everything you make here is something that uh, you have control over, you control the quality of it, and it's USA made, and it's just, it's amazing. If uh, every company did that, we'd be the, we'd be back to where we were a lot, quite a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> And, and Mike, I really like your commitment of making things in the second district. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't get too far from my hometown. <laughs> you know, they, uh, and it's, it's great for me too, seeing you know, my family and, and uh, people I graduated from high school. You know, all these guys that were, when we had everything going overseas, a lot of them had lost their jobs and they came right. to my pillow. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, you know, what's going on here? And, you know, and, they, uh, you know, and then we find out with this president, he's telling everyone, here's what's happened. And, and it was a wake-up call for everybody, and now we're, we're bringing the jobs back, and it's just, I'm seeing other companies do it like we do it at MyPillow, and it's just, you know, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. That's great. You went to the White House to uh, talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, sitting right by the president. He was very, yeah, I actually had a private meeting with him on 2016 before he was elected, and he, he was, and I went in and met with him, and he said, uh, we talked about the inner cities. We talked about uh, the jobs being here and on my pillow. And he goes, "This is what I want." This is, and his heart was so. I went all in for him then. I'm going, "This is the, the mo be the most amazing president in history." And you know, you mentioned the inner cities. I mean, so many of the problems that we see plaguing our society, pla plaguing our great nation, could be solved with with. Good jobs, economic growth, believing in America, uh, investing in America. Absolutely. You don't need a government program. People are happy if they're able to take care of themselves. Right. And that's where my passion. I was a crack cocaine addict. I spent a lot of time, you know, with uh, in the inner city and and uh, with people with getting people working and you know and get these addictions and stuff. I want to do a lot of stuff with that. And uh, God bless. Yeah. God bless. I want to thank you all for, for a great, wonderful panel, uh, Mr. Paulson, Mr. Emmer, Mr. Lewis, and Mr. Lindell. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I know you've had enough, but uh, we're going to... I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Please uh, stick around. <laughs> the best is yet to come. Uh, we're going to hear from... <laughs> is there someone else here? <laughs> we have second... Well, you'll hear, and then soon we will be joined by the Vice President right. of the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Mike Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Before tax reform, Americans were paying more taxes than ever. And our businesses were being taxed higher than any other nation in the industrialized world. Our self-destructive tax code cost Americans millions and millions of jobs, trillions of dollars, the tax code. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Congressman Eric Paulson from the 3rd District of Minnesota. Good morning, Minnesota. All right. Listen, uh, we had a great panel just a little while ago. I know you've all been revved up for our very special guest, uh, but let me start it out by saying this. When the president signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it was a huge achievement, a huge achievement. In just a few months across the country, we have seen billions of dollars going to millions of Americans getting pay raises, special bonuses, better benefits, new investments now that are making our economy boom again. It's exciting. It is a game changer, without a doubt. And it absolutely puts American workers and job creators back in the driver's seat. In just the last two months alone, 550,000 new jobs were created, way higher than expected. And these were not government jobs. These are real jobs for hardworking Americans. And here in Minnesota, we're seeing the exact same results as our employers invest more in their employees and in new capital equipment. You heard the number, or the, the companies already. We've got Best Buy and TCF and U.S. Bank, Priority Courier Express, Data Sales Company, small businesses, and the list goes on and on and on. And the bottom line is you know how to spend your money better than the government, better than the government. That's why tax cuts are so important. And so the good news for Minnesota families and workers and businesses and farmers and seniors keeps rolling in, in more jobs and bigger paychecks and a competitive growing economy. And these aren't just crumbs. These tax cuts are putting real money, real money in the pockets of hardworking taxpayers so you can improve your standard of living, so you can save for your future. And with us today is a very, very special guest a key leader, and I can just tell you that without his leadership, the tax cuts would not have gotten across the finish line. I first got to know Mike Pence because I served with him and he served with me in the, in the United States House of Representatives. In fact, we elected him to be our conference chairman on the leadership team. I will just tell you, we are so fortunate to have him in this role. He is a man of solid character, deep integrity, and very true to his principles. You can always count on Mike Pence to fight for what's right and to fight for our country. With that, I would like you to please join me in giving me a very, very Minnesota warm welcome to the Vice President of the United States, Mike Well, hello, Minnesota. It is great to be back in the Twin Cities with men and women who supported the election of a president and a Congress that passed tax cuts to put America first. Thank you for being here. And I bring greetings. I bring greetings from a friend of mine. And a man who loves Minnesota, and a man who's fighting every day to keep the promises that he made to the people of Minnesota, I bring greetings from the 45th President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump.
And I want to say thanks to a few folks you've already heard from today. First and foremost, thank you to Congressman Eric Paulson. Thank you for his leadership. Thanks for those overly generous words in your introduction. And thank you for your tireless efforts. And Congressman Paulson works on the Ways and Means Committee, and he worked to pass these tax cuts into law. And I want to tell the people of Minnesota, Congressman Paulson has been fighting every day, shoulder to shoulder, with President Trump to make good on all the promises that we made to the people of Minnesota, and we couldn't be more grateful. And with us today, as you may know, are two, two more friends of mine, great members of Congress, fellow conservatives who uh, actually, like me, started their careers in radio. They're strong allies of our president in the House of Representatives. Join me in thanking Congressman Jason Lewis and Congressman Tom Emmer. And I gotta tell you, Congressman Jason Lewis has supported our president from the very start. He's been fighting alongside every step of the way to advance an agenda that's putting hardworking men and women of Minnesota first. And Tom Emmer, is a fighter who's working every day for Minnesota miners and working families to protect your right to explore and to mine the precious metal deposits in Minnesota's iron range all across this state. Join me in thanking both of these great members of Congress one more time, will you? I'm also honored to be joined today by a, a great leader. A great leader who's long been a champion of American prosperity. He's actually traveling with me today. He's been fighting for American jobs and American workers and making incredible progress. Join me in thanking Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, who joins us in Minnesota today. And lastly, let me just take a moment to say thanks to our host today. It's an organization that's promoting the policies that are making a real difference in the life of businesses and families all across Minnesota. Let's say thanks to America First Policies for bringing us all together. I came here today mostly to say thanks, first and foremost, to all of you. Thanks to the good people of Minnesota for all you've done to not only stand with us in the campaign in 2016, but to stand with our administration every day since. Because of your support, I'm here to tell you, you look over the last year and a few months, it's been a year of action, a year of results. It's been a year of promises made and promises kept. starts with providing for the common defense. You know, the first priority of our national, def our, na our national government has been since our nation's inception is the protection of the American people. And I'm proud to say Minnesota is home to many great American patriots serving in the armed forces of the United States of America. I'm very honored to be joined today by a group of these heroes from the 934th Airlift Wing of the United States Air Force Reserves. Would you just show these great Americans just how much we appreciate what they do to protect our country every day. I'm pleased to report to these heroes and all of you gathered here today, President Trump promised to rebuild our military and restore the arsenal of democracy. And five days ago, he did just that, when he signed the largest investment in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan. In fact, the Commander-in-Chief just gave our troops the biggest pay raise in nearly 10 years. And under President Trump, the era of budget cuts of our armed forces is over. Our president, our president has also pledged, he's also pledged to, to stand with those who served in the uniform of the United States. 
If you're able to stand, would you mind, if, you, if you've served in one of the armed forces of this country, would you just mind standing on your feet and giving us one more chance to say thank you for your service? President Trump and I have been working hard with these great leaders in the Congress to make sure that we give our veterans access to the world-class health care that they earned in the uniform of the United States of America, and we're doing just that. President Trump also promised to stand with the men and women who serve on the thin blue line of law enforcement, and I'm proud to report to you that we are once again we're giving the men and women in law enforcement the resources and the respect that they earn and deserve as they protect our families every day. Our president promised to secure our borders, enforce our laws for the citizens of this country, and I'm pleased to report to you illegal crossings at our southern border have been cut by nearly 50 percent. And just last week, President Trump signed into law $1.6 billion of border wall funding that will provide nearly 100 miles of border wall. And when it comes to the wall, make no mistake about it, we're going to build it all. Our president also promised to appoint strong conservatives to our federal courts at every level. We've been busy doing just that. The president appointed Justice Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court of the United States. And last year he set a record for the most court of appeal judges confirmed in a single year for any administration in American history. And they're conservatives all. Closer to home, you know, the president promised to do more than has ever been done to combat the, the scourge of opiate addiction that's ravaging families here in Minnesota and all across the country. You know, when I was governor of Indiana, I, I saw the impact of opiate addiction firsthand. I sat in the kitchen with families still grieving the loss of a loved one. I sat with recovering addicts and heard about the strangle hold of addiction on their lives that they'd only recently broken free from. I'm proud to report to you, thanks to the President's leadership, the strong support of these leaders in Congress, we're on track to partner with states and law enforcement as never before to invest nearly six billion dollars to combat opiate addiction and working with these leaders in Congress, we will make this the generation that ends the opiate crisis in America. In the wake of deadly shootings across our country, our president promised after Parkland, Florida, that this time America would take action. And last week, the president took decisive action to improve school safety when he signed legislation to strengthen background checks and give parents and schools and law enforcement new tools and new resources to keep our kids safe because no child should ever be in danger in an American school, and we will continue to make school safety the top national priority of this administration. So, as I report to you what we've done together, I'm telling you, in this White House, it's been about renewed American strength. It's about security. It's about safety in our communities, in our schools. But what brings us here today is it's also about restoring growth and prosperity for the American people. And since day one of this administration, this president's been keeping his promises to rev the engine of the American economy, and it's working. The president promised to roll back the heavy hand of government. Some of you may remember back on the campaign trail, the president promised to repeal two federal regulations for every new federal rule put on the books. And to be perfectly honest with you, 
We didn't do that. Working with Congressman Paulson, Lewis, Emmer, we actually have repealed 22 federal regulations for every new rule put on the federal court. Including when we repealed the disastrous Waters of the USA rule. We promised to unleash American energy. And early on in this administration, we approved the Keystone and Dakota pipelines. We rolled back the Clean Power Plan. And President Trump put America first when he withdrew the United States from the job-killing Paris Climate Accord. The President also promised to rebuild American infrastructure. If you haven't noticed, you elected a builder to be President of the United States. And just last week, we got a down payment with the support of these members of Congress, $21 billion for our plan to give Minnesota and America the best roads and bridges and best future we've ever had. But in the midst of it all, the President's been working to put America first. I'm pleased to report to you, this president's been fighting every day for free and fair and reciprocal trade. He's been holding our trading partners accountable for agreements. We've been renegotiating deals. I'm pleased to report to you we're making great progress on NAFTA. And just yesterday, the White House announced we have reached an agreement in principle on a renegotiated free trade agreement with South Korea that will put American jobs and American workers first. And finally, and finally, what brings us here today, our president on that campaign trail promised to cut taxes across the board for working families, businesses large and small, in the city and on the farm. And just more than three months ago, with the strong support of these leaders in the Congress, President Donald Trump signed the largest tax cuts and tax reform in American history. That's promises made and promises kept. It's amazing to think we're just we're just one year into this administration and and frankly for all that I've just reported to you all the progress that we've made together with the strong support of these members of Congress you've heard from today and heard about today the results have been nothing short of remarkable since election day American businesses have actually created nearly 3 million new jobs including more than 22,000 new jobs in the Twin Cities area alone The unemployment rate in this country hasn't been this low in 17 years. And in 2017, unemployment in the Minneapolis area fell by nearly 20%. And while Minnesota, get this, while Minnesota lost over 1,000 manufacturing jobs in the last year of the previous administration, under President Trump, Minnesota's factories have bounced back, are booming once again, and since Election Day, businesses across this state have created 7,600 new good-paying manufacturing and construction jobs all across this state. It's just 14 months. I mean, the truth is, with rolling back regulation, with making the right investments in a growing American economy, with cutting taxes for working families and businesses, bottom line, growth is back, confidence is back. Under President Donald Trump, America is back, and we're just getting started. I work with him every day, and I can tell you, for all I just reported to you, that's what this president calls a good start. <laughs> he is relentless. And the truth is, we believe the best days for American growth are yet to come, because the truth is, most of the tax cuts are just starting to make a difference. I mean, we cut taxes for Minnesota's working families. You keep more of your hard-earned money. We cut taxes for Minnesota's businesses. 
So businesses in this state can now compete and win against businesses anywhere in the world with a lower tax rate. If you didn't notice it, we also cut out the cornerstone of Obamacare. And the individual mandate is gone. It's off the books. You know, when you add it all together, all told, we think these tax cuts will save the typical family of four here in Minnesota about $3,000 a year in your taxes. And we think they'll unlock new opportunities for businesses to reward employees with higher wages, bigger bonuses, and better benefits. The truth is, they already are. In fact, we think once all our tax cuts go into effect, that workers here in Minnesota are going to see raises of more than $4,500 a year in the years ahead. And you know, we're already on our way. Because in just the past three months, thousands of Minnesota workers have seen bonuses as high as $2,000. And folks, that's, that's great news for working families. But not everybody thinks that. I mean, you might have heard that uh, the person that wants to be the Speaker of the House again, Nancy Pelosi, when she heard about families getting uh, $1,000 at the end of last year after the president signed those tax cuts. She, she actually said a $1,000 bonus for working families was nothing more than crumbs. Did you hear that? Now let me remind all of you that, uh, you know, Karen and I come from the Joseph A. Bank wing of the West Wing. Are you with me on that? Okay. I mean, really, <laughs> we've lived on a budget our whole lives. And when our kids were little, we had a term for another thousand dollars in the paycheck at the end of the year. Christmas. Yeah. Am I right? I mean, I mean, the truth is, these bonuses and the pay raises that are already happening all across Minnesota are making a real difference in the lives of families in the Twin Cities and all across this state. And I want to say very seriously, any leader who says that a thousand dollars in the pockets of working families is crumbs, is out of touch with the American people. Okay. So let me take a moment to thank some leaders that are in touch with the people of Minnesota. These are great leaders in Congress. I mentioned them before, but I got to mention it again because they were champions of everything that I just described, most especially those tax cuts. Congressman Eric Paulson, Congressman Jason Lewis and Congressman Tom Emmer have been standing with this administration every step of the way. They've been putting America first and they've been putting Minnesota first. And everything I just described happened because of their leadership and support. They helped rebuild our military. They helped roll back the reams of federal red tape that I talked about. And they passed these historic tax cuts that are making a difference here in Minnesota. And I know, I know you are as grateful as the President and I are for these extraordinary leaders. You know, but President Trump and I know, for all of the strong leaders that we work with every day in Washington, D.C., we know that the real strength of this country is not to be found in our nation's capital. The real strength of this country is not found in the marble halls of government. It really, it, the strength and the greatness of this nation has always been found in the, in the hearts and in the character, in the faith, in the work ethic and the resilience of the American people. And Minnesota is proof of that every single day. I mean, the hardworking people of Minnesota have always embodied the American spirit. From the pioneers who carved a a home out of the wilderness of the patriots who were the first to volunteer to fight for freedom in our nation's civil war. To the innovators of every new generation who carry this great state onward and upward. Minnesota has long been and is today America's star of the north. And that star is helping to lead our nation to a better and brighter future. Today, Minnesota's at the forefront of a great American comeback. You really are. 
But folks, that comeback has only just begun. And I came here today not just to say thanks, not just to give you a report, but also to tell you that we need your continued support to move the president's agenda forward. So as I close, as I close, let me, let me say I'm, I'm very humbled that you take time to come out today to see me. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being out. It's, uh, I mean, you know, I'm just a small town boy from southern Indiana. And, uh, I dreamed one day of maybe representing my hometown in the Congress. I had the opportunity to serve my state as governor, but I never imagined, never imagined this grandson of an immigrant would have the opportunity to stand before you as Vice President of the United States of America. And I thank you for your support. encourage you today, before we, before we leave, to take what you've heard here today. Keep doing what you did when you made the decision to come out on a Wednesday afternoon or morning. <laughs> Stay engaged as citizens. Take the energy that, it, frankly, I've seen in this room this morning and carry that out from here. Because uh, the truth is that we've got, we've got our work cut out for us in the days ahead to continue to move this agenda forward. I mean, in, in every real sense, I encourage you to, to let your voice be heard. You know, I'll always believe that, you know, all the cable television networks in the world, all the internet websites in the world, all the mail pieces and TV commercials, don't matter a hill of beans when somebody who knows you and trusts you hears from you about how important it is to support this president, support this agenda, and support the people that are working with us every day. So go tell somebody. Leave here and tell somebody. I mean, reach out to coworkers and neighbors, friends at your place of work, places of worship. I mean, I, I truly do believe I truly do believe that word of mouth is now and will always be the most powerful medium in America. So I just encourage you to go out and tell somebody what you heard. I mean, say, I ran into Mike the other day. <laughs> and he was telling me all the stuff we've gotten done. And not, and not what the president's gotten done and not what the Republican majorities in the Congress, what we have gotten done together. And the people who are gathered in this room, people all across Minnesota and across America, stood with this president, stood with these great leaders, and gave us a government that could, in every real sense, turn this country back in the direction of what's always made this country safe and prosperous and strong. So go tell the story of what's happening in America, among your families and your friends and your loved ones. Tell them, you know, what they're not hearing on most of their cable television networks. <laughs> Tell them about these great congressional leaders, how important it is that we see them continue to have the opportunity to serve and lead. Tell them what we've accomplished. And tell them about the difference that it's making here in Minnesota and all across the country. I mean, tell them we cut their taxes so they can keep more of what they earn. Yeah. Tell them we're restoring American strength at home and abroad, standing with our allies, standing up to our enemies and tell them, tell them we're, we're once again, we're once again taking the steps necessary to protect our families in new and in renewed ways. In a word, tell them we're putting Washington back to work for them, not the other way around. Tell them President Donald Trump, under this administration, the forgotten men and women of America are forgotten no more. You go tell them that when you leave here today. But it's true. It's 
too. And there's one more thing I might one more thing I might encourage you to do if you're of a mind in these challenging times where there seems to be widening threats abroad and too much division here at home. If you're inclined from time to time to bow the head and, and bend the knee and pray for America, I encourage you to do it. When you pray, I'm not so much saying pray for a cause or pray for any particular candidate or party. I'm just saying pray for America because America matters far beyond our shores, the last best hope of earth. And pray for this great nation, all of its people, and all those who serve her every day. I truly do believe, I truly do believe if you continue to do that, if you continue to support this agenda going forward, with your time and, and your voice and in every way as good citizens. With these great leaders in the Congress that we've talked about today, with President Donald Trump in the White House, and with God's help, I know we will make America prosperous again. We will make America safe again. And to borrow a phrase, we will make America great again. Thank you very much, Minnesota. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.